as I mentioned in the last lecture, there's two important networks that you need to know coming out of this course. ConvNets and uh, recurrent nets. Um, ConvNets have changed the world of object recognition and speech recognition. Um, you use ConvNets every day, even if, even if you're not aware. <laughs> Um, Covenants are very much part of your life. They're very much part of your social media life and so on. Um, they're your friends. They're with you. Um, and they'll stay with you until we invent something better. Um, they're, yeah, they're, they've been incredibly successful technology. And, and especially if we can now sort of follow the principle of transfer learning, which is use the embeddings that we already learned in a previous task, uh, you can now, we can now move on to do all sorts of new problems. Like for example, um, let, uh, an even simple example than everything I've shown before, if, if you have an, a ConvNet trained on ImageNet, and I don't know if any of you were, Yala Kun was here a few months ago, right where I am, giving a talk. And he took his, his laptop was much bigger, it has a big GPU, uh, very heavy. And he took a picture of the audience. Uh, so first he demos. Uh, so he took a picture of the audience. I think he might have taken a few objects, like whatever was available here. Say, so you take a picture of this microphone. Um, then of course these objects, like the audience, did not exist on ImageNet. However, you take the image, you feed it through the ConvNet, you compute the output of the ConvNet. So that's a f the feature vector that describes this. Now you store that feature effect. Now you move the camera away. Um, when you move the camera back, and what you can do now is you take the input image, feed it through the net, compute the output. And the dot product is a similarity, or if not the dot product, you could use any other similarity to measure, like e to the minus xi minus xj. Um, so because you've stored the vector for this image, you, as you move the camera, you keep computing the output vector of the ConvNet, and when you go back to the same image as before, the output vector will be very similar to this vector that I've stored for the audience, and so the dot product will be high, the normalized dot product will be close to one, it will be correlated, and then it fires, the unit fires, and you can tell here is the crowd. So, and it's very important that you only need one data sample to do this, one shot learning. So if you've already trained a neural net in ConvNet, and you want to go about and train it on many new objects, like uh, my dog, uh, mom, uh, my house, uh, I don't know, my boyfriend, my boyfriend in the morning, uh, and so on. Um, you would just be taking shots like this and then you keep storing them. And you've built now a very powerful recognizer for our daily experience, for everyday experiences. And all you really need is to be manipulating the output of the component. You don't need to be retraining it again. And that actually is quite important. Like if you if you don't end up coding components, and very few people end up coding components and training components, um, that doesn't mean you shouldn't be using them. You can actually reuse what other folks have already done. It takes weeks to train one on ImageNet. Uh, but once someone, with lots of GPUs and resources and so on, but once someone else has done it, uh, these embeddings exist now, on, they're all over on the web, trained models, so you can reuse them. Um, the other very important and successful model is recurrent nets. And recurrent nets have become really hot, they're very good at all sorts of tasks like translation. Translation is an extremely important task. Um, like imagine that if you want to conduct business with three foreign countries, um, let's say two foreign countries. Um, here's a very terrible example, it's a bad example. Um, possibly borderline politically incorrect. Um, you, 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 you're a clothes manufacturing um, company. You, you, you sell fashion in London. Um, you get your textiles from India. Um, you get them manufactured in China and they get sent here. So your office in London might consist of just three people, and you're coordinating all these people that are in foreign countries and speak foreign languages. 
But thanks to Google Translate, you can send an email saying, um, sorry, translate, any translate. You can send an email to someone. <laughs> And it, the email gets, they receive the email already translated, and, and then they can do the right thing. They can place the order, um, and then they can send. Uh, actually, the example is correct. It's the way they do it that is <laughs> incorrect because they sort of break some laws in the process. Um, but uh, the important thing here is that you would be able to talk to people in other languages seemingly as if, as if there were no other languages. And it's just, it will be within your lifetime that you'll be talking on the phone to someone who speaks a completely different language and you will not even notice that. There's already demos of that. Microsoft has some good demos of that. Um, so even if all the only application was that of recurrent ads, a successful application, which is Essentially, it's like the little fish in what was that book? Hitchhiker's the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy that allows you to understand any language. That's basically what this would give you. Um, it would be pretty cool. And translation is more important than just from one language to the other. Translation is transcribing one signal to another signal. So you can translate images to image captions, you can translate songs to lyrics, lyrics to songs, and so on. So that's a really important observation, because uh, the process of translation is really taking one type of data that's matched uh, to another type of data. Um, and a lot of what we're going to do here with uh, recurrent nets sort of exploits that principle. So in this lecture, I'll go over recurrent nets. I'll mention the problem with the old networks, why it didn't work. Um, um, I'll mention one trick uh, by Hodge, Rita, and Schmidt Huber, um, two researchers in Switzerland, um, who um, actually made these networks work. Um, and then we're going to go over a myriad of applications, um, things like language models, translation, how to generate captions automatically for images, uh, how to take a piece of code and generate the answer just by looking at the code. Um, and eventually something that's very cool that um, it's an archive called uh, neural Turing machines, so differentiable Turing machines. Turing machines are learned from data as opposed to hard coded. So fundamentally a recurrent net is something like this. So it's your normal usual neural network, but now the outputs of some neuron feeds back again into the input. So there's sort of uh, a recurrence. And that's essential to get uh, Turing completeness. Um, let's look at the very simple network here. So um, I'm going to assume that I have an input X. I have some hidden, with just one hidden layer, H. And I have an output layer, Y. So X maps to H, H maps to Y, but H also maps to itself. So one way to draw this uh, network is to think of, um, I could draw it um, as Y, layer X, layer H, H points to itself, and then X goes to Y. An alternative, so, so, so H will always depend on its path, and it recurses at infinitum to the path. So this will allow us to model data that depends on previous data. It will allow us to model sequences of data. And most data, everything we've done up to now in this course always assumes that the data are independent and identically distributed. They're independent from each other. Uh, whereas now the temporal dependence or the spatial dependency old really matters a, a lot. And in fact, that's what we're going to exploit. And, and for cognition, this is very important. Um, and let's pick a subject. <laughs> can I pick on you as a subject? Um, can you say the alphabet forward? A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K. Okay, he's very good at that. Can you say it backward? Um, Z. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, good sport. Um, 
we store the sequence. We don't store the symbols. This is not random access. Try, try with your phone numbers. You might be able to say, in the old days, we could say all sorts of phone numbers. These days, we don't remember. I don't even know mine. But most of you will remember your number forward, but not backward. Um, cops often use this as a test to see whether you're drunk or not. They ask you to say things backward. Um, so sequences are very important to intelligence. And also sequences are se sequences of predictions. As you're about to touch something, like I don't have to touch it. I already know what it feels, what the texture will be, what the temperature will be. And I, I know. I can, I'm always predicting. Everything I do, I'm predicting ahead. And if my prediction doesn't agree with the sensation, which is totally what I imagined, um, then, then I have to learn. But then there's some correction. Um, but if my predictions are fine, then I just use those predictions. So prediction and sequence prediction is extremely important um, to build in, uh, intelligent machines to solve all sorts of data tasks. Um, OK, so another way to draw this network is to expand it over time. So this just gives you a single time slice of the network. Let's introduce the time index. Um, another way uh, to draw this that you'll find is when people try to expand these networks. And the way I'm going to expand them is uh, by, say, going backward like this. Um, and so the idea is you have H1, H2, or actually let's put time to make it more obvious. T minus 1, T, T plus H, T plus 1. So basically I'm unrolling the recurrence. You get the picture. And importantly, when I unroll this, um, is to realize that the parameters are tied. So my parameters going, so I have this hidden layer. It goes through some arbitrary basis function. Could be a rectified linear unit, could be a sigmoid, um, any basis function that you could find in Torch. You multiply times some parameters, you add the input, and that's the next h. So h depends on the, this h here depends on the previous h and on x. And the parameters then are, in this case, theta. This is the matrix of parameters theta x, and this is the matrix of parameters theta y. Um, so you could think of this as a linear layer followed by a sigmoid layer and so on. Or in this case, sigmoid followed by linear layer. And then you need, um, a new element that we'll discuss later, which is when you add the inputs of two layers. In fact, for the next practical, um, I, we're thinking, we're still discussing it, but um, I think the next practical it will be more like just like a tutorial so that you can understand how to group layers together. So basically understand torch and then graph. Um, because you need to understand that to be able to do the last practical, which is I'd like you to run an RNN and feel confident that you can at least pull an RNN out of Torch and do something with it. So then one day if you have real resources as opposed to what we have in the lab here, you can actually train big RNNs and solve all sorts of interesting problems. Uh, especially if you go and work for a bank. Th this type of problems of sequences um, are things that ban bankers love. Just imagine each Y is a dollar sign. Okay. <laughs> Okay, and so when I expand, these are the parameters theta. So it's always the same parameter. I'm just copying the parameter. So the parameters are tied. And that's kind of nice from a storage perspective. It's not, you're not creating many more parameters. And there's different ways in which you can trade this, how you do the passes through the date and so on. And that's something we, we can attack during the practical as well. Um, but uh, first, I want to sort of mention why this sort of 
Um, I mean, these methods were, have been with us for a long time. They, they weren't working. Um, and the problem is that derivatives became zero when you backpropagate. And, uh, or they exploded, like they become uh, not a number of things in your computer. Um, and so f folks didn't know how to get these models to work. And it's very frustrating, because here is something that's Turing complete. You know, it's a model, a neural model that is trainable and extremely powerful, because you could implement uh, any computable function, but you can't train it. Uh, that's a catch because the derivatives don't quite work out. Um, and so I'm going to try to take you over why that was a problem. And for that, I will use an example of um, that I got from Joshua Benjamin and some of his colleagues. Um, I think Raz, one, one of my uh, new colleagues at DeepMind actually was the domain author in this paper. Um, so the so we have this model, this sequential model, um, and if you wanted to compute the derivatives um, for each of these, after each of these y's, we still have uh, we still compute the loss. So we would have the loss at time t. We would have the loss at time t plus one. Um, the loss at t plus 2 and so on. So you can compute all the losses if you unroll. And so you really want to minimize the predictions at every time step. So the sum of the, those losses. So, so we use, if we go over a horizon of capital S steps, you, um, so you unroll this for capital S steps, you would want to minimize that. Um, if you do the chain rule, and you want a derivative of, let's just look at one of the terms at time t for now. Um, if you, if you want to compute a derivative of et with respect to, say, the transition parameter theta, then you would have to go from, um, and suppose that you're looking at the theta that happens in layer k. And here, very importantly, um, the theta happens in all layers. Okay, so, so theta doesn't happen only once. So when you compute a derivative, and, and I really recommend you do this, take this model, do two steps by hand. So in your notebook, do just two steps by hand and compute the derivative with respect to theta. Nothing I say in these slides will help you more than if you do that. Because then you'll see exactly how, what the exact derivative is and you'll see where all my sums come from. Um, because the parameter occurs many times, you need to sum over all the places before time t where the parameter could have occurred. And you can confirm that by doing your derivation. Um, and so my derivative, I would have to go from e t, when I do backpropagation, I have to go from et to yt, yt to ht, and eventually through the network, many layers from ht up to the layer k, which is much, which is further back than the layer t. And then I take the derivative, the immediate derivative with respect to theta. Okay, so basically I would be picking one of, if, if this is t, if this is the one that I'm care about, I, I would be back propagating like uh, this, and then the derivative would involve that xt, but I would also need to deal with the previous theta, so it would also have to go like this, and so on. So I would have several paths that will encounter theta, and I need to add them up. Um, now, this term, which is the derivative of uh, time t with respect, uh, the hidden layer time t with respect to the layer at time k, is itself, that Jacobian is itself a product of Jacobians. Because um, I still have to go from t to k, I need, if I, if I go layer by layer taking derivatives, I actually need to take a product of all the Jacobians uh, between step k and step t. Okay, because the chain rule, uh, essentially I have many inputs, many, an input, an output, an input, an output, an input, an output, and the chain rule, I have to do the chain rule throughout all these stages. And if you do that for a simple model, once you get to stage h minus one, um, essentially it's the derivative of this guy with respect to this guy, which would just give me theta transpose. 
um, and then the derivative of phi, which I'm just calling phi prime. And I'm putting it in a diagonal matrix so that the dimensions agree. And I also recommend for these sort of tedious calculations that you check at home that they're correct. More importantly, um, um, I want you to get the, the global picture. We're computing derivatives through the network using essentially the chain rule. Um, and if I do that, I will end up with these Jacobian terms that multiply many times. And that's where the problem will lie. Because um, let's assume that I pick some basis function so that its derivative is always upper bounded by some constant, say a half or something like that. Um, then if I look at the norm, um, if I, I can also look at the uh, L2 norm of uh, um, the L2 norm of this matrix of parameters. Theta is a matrix of parameters that multiplies the input because we're working with a linear layer. And the L2 norm uh, corresponds to what in terms of eigenvalues? One of the, cl I think I gave it as an exercise. Pardon? The largest eigenvalue. Did I give that as an exercise? I think it was one of, yeah, first, first, yeah, because I often do give exercises that become useful for later stages uh, or for the exams or <laughs> um, and the lectures are certainly useful for the exam so uh, the videos will be useful <laughs> at that stage um, and so um, when we multiply um, the exam by the way I'm, I'm going to be testing understanding and I'm going to be testing that you can and given the understanding you have from this course, that you can go and read a paper out there and you can basically say what's good and what's bad about it. That's the kind of um, type of understanding I expect uh, from students uh, at this level where you are, regardless of precisely whether you're in fourth year or um, masters and so on. Um, that's the kind of thing. I, I don't want you to be memorizing. I don't want to be testing your linear algebra either. That would, that, that would have been tested hopefully two years ago or so. Um, the linear algebra, however, is useful for this type of calculation I'm doing here. Um, I can look at this and I can say, well, the, the, if the largest eigenvalue is lambda theta, um, then this whole thing um, will get multiplied uh, t minus k uh, steps, and so if k is say 100 steps before t, if I'm trying to compute derivatives all the way back 100 times steps, um, then this Jacobian, this term here, let's trace it back with another color, uh, the term in blue, the norm of that matrix will be given by a, essentially a constant to uh, uh, a power t minus k. What happens if it's large than um, 1? It explodes. It becomes a very large number because it's an exponential. Uh, if it's less than 1, it goes to 0. So the gradient either explodes or goes to 0. Um, so that means that the input at stage k uh, any of the signals at hk do not influence the output at stage t. So the information from the past is not going to really help you. You're not really learning temporal. If you have something that requires very long memory, this is not going to give it to you. Okay, so for example, um, assume that you want um, to build an RNN that, uh, that fires when it sees um, a sequence of A's followed by a sequence of B's of the same length. So for example, if it sees A, B, it out, its output should be 1 um, because there's an equal number of A's and B's. If, he's, if it sees A, A, B, B, the output should be 1. Um, if it sees a million A's followed by a million B's, the output should be 1. If it sees anything else, the output should be zero. As long as what you want is this to output uh, this automaton to basically uh, output a one when the number of A's and number of B's. So it needs to learn to count, basically. Um, 
And if the number of phases is very large, and then if the sequence are very large, it really, you really need a big memory to solve this. Um, if you implement uh, this type of na uh, na if you implement naively like this, and so this approach is not going to work. Um, you you sort of want this to be a one. Okay, so then uh, the information gets. And recently, there was a paper coming out of Facebook with Thomas Mikolov and so on, where I think they take a sub-block of this matrix and just slap a diagonal there of, you know, with a constant so that the gradient doesn't vanish. The popular way of doing this, however, is via LSTM. Um, and so LSTM was introduced to solve this problem. So it's good to motivate it like this. So let's go back to the simple recurrent net. But in order to be able to use the language of LSTMs, I'm going to change the symbols. So H is now going to be the output for this simple neuron. Um, the input is going to be G. It often is what's used up here, a lot of coders use for gate. And um, the, the, the recurrence is going to be in this thing called C, which stands for cell. So we're, trying, we're going to try to build a cell with memory. Um, so our picture, as before, was there is this cell here with parameter theta. You have G, and there's a parameter theta G here, and then there's an output which is HD after doing a tan H nonlinearity, which reminds me, I don't think we've done the tan H. Um, a sigmoid is between... 0 and 1, a tan h function, hyperbolic tangent that is, same thing but between plus 1 and minus 1. Okay. So it's nice if you don't want to have you know, zeros and so on to use something between minus 1 and 1. Um, and now this is just the same neural network that we still had and that when you do the Jacobian, you're going to multiply this theta many times, and, and then if you look at the norm um, of all those multiplications, it's either going to explode or it's going to go to zero. So we still have the problem. So as I just mentioned before, one solution is put a one here. Okay. Now, that is problematic. Because essentially, as you're feeding the input, uh, you're just basically um, adding to the counter the previous counter. So this is just basically incrementing things. So this is not a very good memory. It's a memory that just grows. Um, you need to be able to decide, when you have a memory, when are you going to put more stuff into the memory? When are you going to read out of the memory? And you need some way of erasing the memory, resetting, like in a modern computer. So we arrive at LSTM. So in LSTM, we're going to use something that's gating. And gating is just component-wise multiplication. Um, the idea is we're going to create these symbols, <coughs> these uh, signals, between 0 and 1. So for that, we will use a logistic unit between 0 and 1, a sigmoid unit. And we're going to feed as input the previous age, the previous hidden signal, uh, previous hidden layer, and x. And so now there's two quantities. There's the, the hidden layer, and then there's the cell, which also has a, a recurrence. So we have the previous age, the current x, um, and that goes through a sigmoid and gives you something between 0 and 1. And that decides whether the input goes into the cell or not. That multiplies the input and it, it, you just essentially have a switch, 0 or 1, except that it's a smooth switch, somewhat 0, somewhat 1 sometimes. Um, of course, you don't know the switch. You don't know when to write to memory and when not to write to memory. So the genius of this model is that you learn that from data as well. The data, this is all the same data. The input data will go into a read-write gate, sorry, a read gate, into a forget gate that basically multiplies C times this um, input FT. 
So if ft is zero, you multiply c times zero, you erase the memory. And you also will have an output gate which again uses the input data and then you produce the output for the next cell. Okay? So you essentially take, so if we go back to our picture, we're still taking uh, an H in, we're producing an H out, and we're providing a signal X. Okay. And for now I've not included the Y, but you could also you know, output the Y, and we'll, we'll see that later. But for simplicity I kept that uh, aside. Um, this H could be actually the Y when you get to the last layer and the previous, and you could start from X, as we will soon see. Um, so that's basically what an LSTM unit is. It's something that now, and originally what folks did is they just put a one here, and there was, there was no forget gate. And that was, you basically wouldn't keep writing to it, but you would only write into the memory when this gate allowed you to. And then you would read it out when the, the output gate here allowed you to. The forget gate just allows you to reset um, the memory. And the beautiful thing about this is it's all um, like if it, it has this beautiful principle that sometimes you would want like if only I knew this context I would know which model to use. But I don't know the context. And if you don't know that, then you should learn that too. And you should learn the model. And you should learn them both at the same time. And so these multiplicative um, uh, operations are very useful. When you implement it, um, the same, this picture gets translated to this code. You have um, X, you have the previous H, that allows you to get I, and then you do exactly the same operation for the other gates. Um, and then you do this pointwise multiplication, so that's scalar multiplication. So if you have x1, x2, <coughs> multiplied by y1, y2, by this I mean uh, you multiply each entry one times the other, entry-wise multiplication. And then that's it. Now these are linear layers, so you would know how to implement them in Torch. So you can implement this very easily in Torch. Linear layers followed by sigmoid layers and tan edge layers. Um, the only other things that we need to know is how to add two layers and how to multiply them. So we again need to design layers to do these two operations. And then we're done. We can implement this. It's easier said than done, though. Yeah, you'll see that the code is actually tricky. Brendan and I spent quite a bit of time uh, w with him actually helping me with through it. Um, the multiplication layers are very simple. Um, you now have two inputs. So now we're moving away. So you now could think of this as X1 coming from one neural network, X2 coming from another neural network. So now we actually have uh, a graph that's no longer sequential, but you actually will have nodes converging and nodes diverging and so on. Um, and then the output is uh, the variable z. And if you take the derivative, um, or with respect to, um, again, the chain rule as before, was if you want the derivative with respect to the input, in this case, if you pick this input, um, you need the backward message, which is the derivative with respect to the output, times the derivative of the output of the module um, with respect to the input of the module, and that will give you this expression here. And um, you can go over the. I've I've done it in entry wise. Um, I've rederived it here, component wise, so that you can convince yourself that that's correct. Um, in Torch, uh, a single LSTM cell will essentially again you basically specify the input, which is a sigmoid, and then you need to pass. Um, to it wx, uh, sorry, theta x plus theta h, the previous h, and for that you implement a function. So instead of, instead of introducing the parameters here individually, um, we just call a function that creates uh, linear layers 
from X to H and from the previous H to the new H and then we create a, um, a module that has that adds those two um, so you add you have this node, this other node, you add them um, then you just pass that through and that will create them with different parameters the, um, so the nice thing about having a function inside a function um, so that creates the in gate, the input gate. Next, you create a forget gate, just the same way. The cell gate. Um, then the C gate is you had to add two things: the forget gate, C multi table that implements the layer that we just described in the previous slide, entry wise multiplication. So you do the entry wise multiplication of the previous C with the forget gate. Um, the output gate is as the other layers and you compute the next H and so update C, get the next H and you're done. Okay, so typically it's this module where you take the X, the uh, H previous, which in this case is called the prev H, the previous H, and then you get out um, the next H and and you get out the next C. So that's a single cell. It could be multivariate because the cell, I mean these are all, uh, you can think of all the H's, the I's as vectors in Rn as we've been doing uh, when we described it here. So X could be an input vector, this would be a this could be a vector in Rn, this would be a matrix that's n by n, and so the gate would be a vector in Rn. Um, and that will create a single unit. If you want to create a network, you just need to copy these units. right? And if you want to have them with the same parameters, so you first will copy them like this, and if you want to have them with the same parameters, and the, the copying code is this, but for that, Brenda will help you with it. Um, and then, in order to clone them, uh, in order to move, they use the same parameters, so just clone the network. Um, and if you do that, you can build networks like this one here, uh, where you can put a, a, an input sequence of words in English, an input sequence, and an output sequence of words in Mandarin, and then you learn all the parameters uh, by doing backpropagation. Um, on this LSTM and voila you get a translation model and if you want more layers you just add more layers and so here um, if we pick one of these guys it takes the H at T minus 1 so basically it sends um, it sends the H, it has its own parameters, so each of these guys have uh, different parameters, so this will have theta 3, this will have theta 4. The parameters get replicated on, on these cells, so they get replicated over time, but they are different parameters um, as you go up in the hierarchy. And that will give you different time scales for these processes. And by having multiple paths, you have different time scales, so different ways in which one word in one language could get propagated to influence another word. Um, so there's more ways of propagating information on the network than when we just have one layer. And um, so that's for the network theta i, one of those thetas, and you also get as output a CT, so it's a single LSTM cell. But so HT gets sent up and to the right, and he also sends CT to the right. And then, and then you have the H of the previous layer coming. So the X is essentially the H of the previous layer. And when you get to the bottom, the X is the date. These models are huge, as you can tell by these parameters. They take a long time. So this allows you to go from one language to another language. Um, if you have, instead of doing syntax like the usual way as you would do in the old school way, um, you can just, if you have already, uh, if linguists have already given you supervision, um, linguists are not needed anymore. 
um, because now you can just use uh, this model to go from English to a parse. Linguists do other very useful stuff. Uh, but how, uh, that was a joke. Um, um, you can also go from a sequence of code instructions, which is just a sequence, to an output. And there's a paper by these guys that does that with some success. Uh, it's not perfect and there's some bugs in it, um, but, uh, but it's nonetheless a quite impressive result. Uh, you can predict video, video in, video out. So some of my colleagues are very busy working on this for games. Um, I've already shown you this before, Alex Graves. And a lot of the work, the stuff, this is, I really learned a lot of the stuff from Alex. And he has a very nice report on his web page um, on recurrent neural networks, which, like, if you want to spend more time on it. And in fact, in the next class, we're going to go over this. And I, I want to go in detail over this, just as example. And then in the second lecture, I want to go over how to generate images. And here I think the, the first one is the real one, and all the other ones are just the model writing. It's pretty impressive. Um, and more recently, Alex and some of um, other folks at DeepMind implemented this neural Turing machine, which is very, again, we saw memory networks in the last lecture. The Turing machine has a controller. It's essentially, it's an architecture of a typical Turing machine. You have read heads, write heads, and you have some sort of memory. Um, and it would take data as input, an input sequence, an output sequence, um, and it just basically learns how, which things should I store, which things should I retrieve in order to, say, answer a question. How should I do manipulations? If you give me a sequence and the output is the sequence sorted, how do I sort? So it should learn, should learn how to sort. So you can think of any algorithm from your algorithms class um, that where you took an input and you had an output and you use a modern Turing, you know, one of actually random acts, you use whatever algorithm that's implementable on a Turing machine. Um, this should be able to do it except that you only presented input examples and output examples, and it should figure out what the program is to do that. Um, I'm not going to go in, in detail into it, but it essentially um, it has read gates, it has erase gates, it has write gates. They're very similar to what we saw for um, LSTMs. The main difference is that instead of having just a single cell memory, um, it will have a whole matrix of memory, and you can access you can access this memory to write into the memory, and you can access it to, to retrieve facts. And the access is given by this wait function. Like to read, um, you just there there is a function that goes over this memory, maybe something like this. That's your W, and you just multiply that times the memory. Usually, this will be actually very spiky. Uh, you multiply that times the memory, and that's the fact that you retrieve. Um, the controller, you could implement it in many ways. It basically takes the input and uh, some reads, and it has to output what should be added to the memory, whether you should erase. Um, it outputs the parameters of the heads, so it controls the heads and the, uh, the actual output of the machine. And it involves many steps. I'm not going to go, obviously, don't have time to go over them in, in detail, um, but they're described in the paper. And here's an example where they provide us input this sequence, which is um, here time goes like this, and this is, I think, eight inputs. So it's eight, eight sequences of numbers. And then the last one is just something, a number that says how many times the machine should copy the task. So the machine is presented a bunch of inputs and what it learns, here we're looking at, the, uh, at this W function and as you can see it is sort of very picked and it changes over time, so it moves to the left, uh, sorry, moves down. Um, white is where that W function is. So it's essentially learning to write the input and once it's uh, so this is what it learned. It learned to write the input when it's presented. And then it learned to then withdraw the input, uh, read the input. 
and copy it. So it's able, and it copies it the right number of times, showing that you know it's capable of having this um, long-term memory, longer-term memory. Um, another, another model that's also very popular for. Um, I'll just go over this quickly because the application, as you'll soon see, is super cool. Um, is uh, Dmitry Badano and a um, bunch of folks in Montreal. Um, they he implemented this model to do translation, where once again you have the input sentence X, the output sentence Y. But instead of just going through all these nodes, he decided to have a gate bottlenecks so that you would know so essentially he's very interested in having a neural network that says how much a word in one language should be associated with a word in another language so he doesn't just want to generate a, uh, a translation but he actually wants to be able to say that the word um, uh, gato in Spanish matches the word cut in Afrikaans and so he does this um, um, this way. Uh, so this is basically a parameterized neural network. Um, so you have the outputs all of all of your hidden units, and then they get gated again by the scalar alpha. So we see this concept of gating appearing again, um, and that d determines then which of these H's gets matched to this S. Could be this H. Could be this other H. He does one more thing, is he does a two-pass LSTM, which I haven't described at all, but you can sort of find out about that. That's not the most important thing. The important thing is this gating. And the gating is useful because then you can do things like this. You can take an image, you run an already trained convolutional network, and you get features and where the features occur. So the ConvNet will also tell, I know it will say that there's a wing feature here, and there's maybe a water feature here and so on. So you get many of these features. And then your t and, and so here's where the alignment comes in. Because you basically want to say what in the image is what? What is a wing? What is water? What is a bird? And it will do this by doing um, this thing that we started the course with, which is attending to things where you don't see everything but you just see a little bit. And so it will learn to attend to these different regions in the image by using gating. And then given the gate, then it generates a, a word using a recurrent net. And in fact, the recurrent net can output one word, and then the next word, and then the next word. Um, and so it actually generates a sentence. And here's an example of what it actually does over time. Um, so right now we're talking about, there's two results here, right now we're talking about the top one. We'll talk about uh, the bottom one in two weeks time. But essentially it's going A, when it says bird, it's attending to the bird, flying over A and now body, so it attends to the water, off water. So I, I picked this result because that's one of the nice results. In their paper on archive, they have like an appendix full of other results and some of some of which are not compelling um, as this one but nonetheless um, very cool um, I'm not going to go into the model but it's basically the same thing it's gating uh, so it's again it's using this sort of uh, gating mechanism here with these gates on the outputs of the ConvNet so you have the outputs of ConvNet all the features that occur you have a sequence of words and you essentially gate over the outputs of the component to figure out which part of that image maps to what word as you're translating. So you're looking in different places and as you're looking you're coming up with a, an explanation. Um, that's, that's pretty much uh, it for today's lecture. For the next lecture I'm going to focus on uh, Alex Graves that um, how he actually, we're going to look into the details of how he generates text. And those are important details because those are the same details that I didn't go over in order to, under, to describe a neural Turing machine. And those are details that will be needed um, in order for me to show you um, something called variational autoencoders, uh, which allow you to generate uh, 
beautiful images. So close your eyes, boom, beautiful images of numbers and so on. Um, and that will be in the second lecture. And um, in order for you to get the most out of that lecture, I recommend you take uh, Kevin Murphy's book, which is in the library. There's several copies um, if you don't have a copy. And there's a section on variational inference that he uh, describes. Um, and just read the one or two pages introduction to that, because um, it, then the lecture will be a bit easy. So this requires a little bit of more sophistication and inference. Um, in order to go to the variational world. Um, but even if you don't get the math in that lecture, I, I want you to at least see the application of what you could do and, and understand the idea. And, and essentially what we're going to exploit is this um, view of learning where you learn when the world doesn't match what you imagine. Except we're going to come up with a very cool way of doing that. Um, and um, yeah, um, the videos. Uh, I'm sure when I show you the videos, you'll think like me that it's pretty cool. Thank you.